If you're flying your UAV, you don't want to get a ticket. How are you going to prevent people from doing that? Yes, yeah, so until now it was really complex. Uh, you needed to get out a sectional chart, you needed to know the local ordinances, you needed to know National Park Service regulations, NOAA regulations. I mean, it was hard. Um, and my partner and I got together, uh, my partner and, and a co-founder of AirMap is a commercially rated pilot. Uh, he founded the largest jet aircraft company in the world, so he knows aviation. And as a professor of law and pol public policy, I know law and policy. And so we got together and we said, let's make a, an app um, and it's a web app, so it's just a free website that you go to called AirMap, and you can turn on different layers and see this complexity and make sure that you're not getting a ticket. Well, great, let's see it in action. Sure. All right, so this is AirMap. The, it's airmap.io is the URL, and what you're seeing here is the desktop version. You get the identical features if you log into this URL on your browser. So if you're on an Android phone or an, uh, an iOS phone, you get the exact same thing. The only difference is, is that on the Android or iOS phone, the tray slides in and out. And so it'll be, you'll have to turn that on and off on the Android phone or on the iOS phone. That's to save screen space. And so imagine now, um, we're t what we're looking at now is the city of San Mateo in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's just south of San Francisco's uh, International Airport, and there are a bunch of airports that you can't see here. To, to see this um, on an airspace chart, it, it's a complex mixture of different overlays and whatnot that the drone operator isn't really uh, that interested in because the drone operator is operating on like a city block. And so let me show you just how the level of detail we're talking about. If you're in the city of San Mateo and you're a recreational operator, the uh, law requires you to contact uh, towers when you're within five miles of an airport. And so let's turn that layer on to see what happens. So immediately, if you're in the city of San Mateo, what you see is that there's SFOs, airport five mile radius, San Francisco International, and you have San Carlos Airport's five mile radius. And so what does that mean when we zoom in? It looks like there's a lot of places, there are a lot of places that you can't fly. And actually when you zoom in, what's fascinating about it is that if you live on Ninth Avenue, you're okay. But if you want to fly in Central Park, just off Ninth Avenue, you've got to contact SFO. Whereas if you want to fly over here on 10th Avenue, you have to contact San Carlos Airport. And so this is like really important information for the drone operator that just simply does not show up on aeronautical charts or on any other app that's out there. And so when you look at the level of detail we're talking about. So if you live on 9th Avenue, let's turn on the satellite view just to give you an idea. This is actually zoomed out more uh, farther than most drone operators will operate because if you're flying in your backyard, this is the airspace that you're concerned with, not all of this. And so we really have to get down to the building level. So this building is a great example, right? And so it's rendering up in Google Maps. And so you can see it's a little pixelated, but you know where that building is, right? We turn on Street View. You know that that's a building uh, on the corner of 9th and El Camino Real. We turn on the satellite view and you can actually see the building. So now imagine you're a commercial operator and you're going to go out to inspect the roof of this building. If you are taking pictures of that building for fun as a recreational operator, you're okay because you're not five miles, uh, you're more than five miles from SFO and from San Carlos, which is not on this screen. But if you're a commercial operator, here's your problem. That building is inside San Carlos's airspace. Now, how did that happen? FAA regulations are so complex that if you're flying for commercial purposes, you have to be five nautical miles from an airport, whereas if you're recreational, you have to be five statute miles from an airport. So we're talking about that level of detail between the two uh, pieces of airspace information. Those are the current rules that are in effect. If I zoom out, what you can also begin to see I'm going to give us a, a really big broad view so you can see the future set of rules that are coming, which is that under part 107, those rings will be different. Those rings will instead be classes of airspace. And so we've put the shapes of the airspace information and on an aeronautical chart, these things extend for dozens of miles from the airport. But for operators who operate a drone, those long extensions beyond here don't matter. See where my finger is over, uh, over in this area on the left, over the Pacifica. Um, that doesn't matter um, to the drone operator because 
the airspace here continues out, but it changes, uh, but it's above 500 feet. And so this is just the airspace information below 500 feet. That's to say exactly what drone operators need. Now let me show something else that, uh, that a lot of other apps simply don't have, and that's information about other low altitude pieces of information. And so uh, we still pull in the federal temporary flight restrictions updated um, in near real time, uh, prohibited special use airspace, rest restricted special use airspace. We have national parks also, which include no fly zones. So if you wanted to do real estate photography in San Mateo, in this community right here, you would not only have to worry about SFOs class B airspace to request permission from the tower, but if you were down in this area here and you were trying to follow this road to do your, to do your real estate photography, as you were planning it out, you'd realize that you could do houses on one side of the street only up until here where you'd require permission to contact the tower, but if you went this direction, you'd fly over the national parks. We also add in a really cool set of layers like hospitals, schools, and heliports. There are no, in some jurisdictions, there are rules that say you can't fly over a school. It's a local ordinance. There are rules that say that you can't fly over hospitals. But for the most part, there are not that many ordinances now. But if you're flying near one of these things, so if you're flying near a community college, um, if you're flying near an elementary school or something, you very well might have to worry about people not be as a matter of law being concerned with your operation, but as a matter of their own simple concerns and maybe they're going to hassle you. So letting you know that there's an elementary school nearby tells you that maybe, I, maybe I'll do the aerial imaging that I want to do on a Saturday or a Sunday instead of doing that imaging on, uh, on a school day or when mom's picking up her kids. The last thing we add in is this layer called private properties. This is proprietary information from the website noflyzone.org. Here's one right here where, um, where people can register their properties to say, hey, I don't want your drone flying over my property. It's not enforceable by law. It's just, that it's just something that gives you a heads up. So if you wanted to fly in this uh, community park here, um, assuming that there's no law restricting you from flying in this community park, you might want to do it on this side of the park, the south side of the park, instead of here on the northwest side of the park, where this person might come out and give you and your you know, four-year-old or your 10-year-old a hard time. And so part of the app is designed to give you the information to avoid hassles. And so those are all the features. The big thing that we're working on now, because we're in beta, is feature requests. You can click this and it will open up a comment field where you can ask for the feature you want. And we're adding a link tomorrow that all links out to dronezoning.org where you can fill out the information about the local drone rules in your jurisdiction. So if you got a ticket, you can make sure someone else doesn't get a ticket. And we'll add that information and those layers to the website. So we just learned that the city of San Mateo has a local ordinance that doesn't allow people to fly remote control aircraft in their parks. And so uh, in the next few weeks, we're going to add a shape color over San Mateo parks so that people know that if you go fly a drone in a park, you can actually get a ticket. And the, the important thing about that is that if you're anything like me, when you get the drone in the mail, the first per place you think you can fly is in a state park or in a local park. And it's actually the place where you'd get a ticket. You'd be smarter going somewhere else other than a park. And so we think that inf information is really important and our users have been providing that kind of feedback. And so that's just a brief overview of what it looks like in San Mateo, California. So right now we're looking at the at the national picture because you know from the demonstration you might wonder like is this just California um, and so you can also understand the complexity of what we're trying to do. Um, we're constantly receiving information and feedback about a variety of ordinances and so many people might want to look at a specific address, not just where they're operating right now, but a place they're planning on going. So let's say we want to go to Colorado. Right? And so um, Lori State Park in Colorado, Fort Collins, Colorado. I start typing it. The search tool immediately begins to give me some completions and so I can just click that park and what will end up happening is that the tool will, will center on that's my new area of search. 
Um, and if you're curious about what the national picture looks like before I zoom in, let's just, uh, let's just turn on the five mile radius around airports in America. And you can start to immediately see the number of airports. What's really interesting too is that the FAA has left as, uh, th there's an ambiguity in the FAA regulation as to whether airports include private airports. And so if I turn that on, the map becomes even more red. Um, and so it becomes really hard to find out where, uh, if you didn't have this tool, there's no way that you would know about private airports, which might include the, air, the airfield out back of someone's mansion, where they're able to land their airplane, but no one else can land there. I'm gonna turn that off for now, uh, just because of the complexity. And let's go, let's go down to Lorry State Park. Um, and so uh, if we start to zoom in on, the, on Lorry State Park, what we'll start to see as we get closer, as these these radius uh, these radii around the airports are starting to uh, get bigger for us, um, and I'm going to turn them off for now, just uh, because we're on the showroom floor and it's uh, affecting the the load rate. Um, you know, so you can turn the layers on and off at will, depending if you're in an area where you don't have have good Wi-Fi signal um, or good uh, 4G. And so this is Lori State Park. Um, we're about to add state parks. Um, we're in communication with the various uh, state park authorities. And so when we turn those layers on, what you'll get is something similar to the national parks layer. So I'm turning on the national parks layer now. And what right now, we don't have any national parks in the area of Lori State Park. So uh, when we get out, zoomed out a little bit, we start to see this park here. I can click on it and see that that's Rocky Mountain National Park. And so interesting line here right you could fly in this open space in roosevelt national forest but not in rocky Mo mountain uh, national park because it's just a distinction between uh, the two types of land uh, we're reaching out to the forest service to see if they have regulations that we need to be aware of the whole goal is that agencies and administrations are uh, and uh, other local jurisdictions are passing rules and they're hidden on websites in PDFs and in other places where most people won't know they're breaking a rule until they get the ticket and that's why dronezoning.org is so important so we can find that out we can also look at the classes of airspace near um, uh, near uh, Lori State Park looks like um, there is a uh, Fort Collins class E airspace um, Class E airspace is the most confusing thing to try and understand about airspace rules because traditionally Class A E airspace doesn't extend to the ground. It only extends to the ground in certain places near certain airports. And so if you read an aeronautical chart, it'd be almost impossible for someone who's not a trained pilot to understand whether the airspace extends down to the ground. Um, and so if we turn on our five mile uh, radius, what you also then see is that not only the controlled airspace, but right near Lorry State Park, there's another airport. And it's a small one um, because you can see the radius is smaller. Under the rules, that, depending on the size and nature of the airport or heliport, the rules are five nautical miles, three nautical miles, or two nautical miles. This is Christman Field, and it has a radius about it that actually takes account of Lorry State Park. So even if there wasn't a Lorry State Park regulation that would prevent you from flying in Lorry State Park, depending on the part the area of the park that you're located in, you might have to provide notification to Crispin Field, letting them know that you're operating. We're adding the telephone numbers for airports so that you can actually call straight from the web app directly to the airport um, so you can let them know that you're, that you're in their area of operations and uh, let them know that you're going to be flying there. So this is an overview of AirMap. This is the login screen that you would get on desktop version, uh, very similar to what you would see on, uh, on the iOS uh, or Android browser version, which is all we have now, our websites, web apps. Um, and what you'll see on both is this, which of these applies to my operation. This was a simple infographic we created that when you click this, what happens is it opens up into another page that walks you through each type of operation. So let me talk about them. Right now, there's a proposed rule for future uh, regulations governing unmanned aircraft. It's uh, technically referred to as Part 107. Drone operators will have heard of it as, uh, as the NPRM or the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. And this is just illustrating here that under that future rule, which has a lot of pieces to it, but with regard to airspace around airports, what the rule requires is that if you have a commercial operator's certificate, 
You'll need to obtain air traffic control authorization before flying in controlled airspace, which is class B, C, D, or the portion of E airspace that's designated for an airport. And so this is all really complex if you're trying to look at an aeronautical chart. We've made it very easy for you where it looks basically like these shape forms here. And if those colored shapes are overlaying where you're planning on flying your drone, you're going to need to contact air traffic control. Um, and that's under the future rule, which we expect to be implemented late 2015 or early 2016. Under present rules, you're going, to need to, uh, you're going to need to focus on, if you're a commercial operator who's received a 333 exemption, you have to remain five nautical miles away from an airport that has an operational control tower. So that's a five nautical mile ring or three nautical miles from an airport that has a published instrument flight procedure but not an operational tower, two nautical miles from an airport without a published instrument flight procedure or an operational tower, and two nautical miles from a heliport that has a published instrument flight procedure. If you're anything like me, not a pilot, my co-founder's a pilot, I'm not a pilot, I'm a law professor, I study this stuff and write about it every day, that to me is confusing. And so these shapes immediately answer the question for you, telling you, remain away from those areas and depending on the certificate of authorization and your 333 exemption that you have from the FAA you may be able to contact the tower to request permission to fly within those areas but this immediately tells the there are a couple hundred operators who are approved now the FAA is going to approve about a thousand more uh, 333 operators those 333 operators who are flying commercially this tells you basically what you have to do makes it a lot easier for them to operate for the vast majority of us who have a drone that we bought online and we're flying it for recreation or, or hobby use, the rule that applies for us under Section 330, uh, 336 of the FAA Modernization and Reform Act is that you fly in compliance with community-based guidelines and that if you're flying within five miles of an airport, the operator of the aircraft provides the aircraft operator and the air traffic control tower with prior notice of the operation. The way you can do that is if you're flying frequently, you can have a letter of agreement with the airport or you have to call the airport operator on the telephone, which in our, uh, in our next update, we're going to provide telephone numbers, not just the shapes and the description of the airport. You can click and it'll give you the phone number. You have to contact them to let them know that you're flying. Uh, and usually they'll say, go ahead, or they'll want your cell phone number or they'll say, you know, let me know when you're not flying in that area. What's really confusing about this is that these are five mile rings around two airports in the city of San Mateo as a good example. Those mile radiuses are, radii are in statute miles because those are the rules for recreational operators. But if you got a certificate and started operating for commercial purposes, this graphic here illustrates that five nautical miles, which are longer than statute miles, would create an overlap between these areas, presenting the possibility that you might have to con contact two air traffic uh, uh, control operators or two, uh, two airports for permission to operate in those spaces. And so it's very complex and the app is designed to make it easy by showing you the information so you know what you have to do to get up in the air and also so you know what you have to do to fly in compliance with the law. So this is drone zoning Org. This is a website we created because uh, the best way to get them uh, the information about the thousands of drone ordinances across the country is to ask drone operators who have run into a hassle with a city official or with a police officer who maybe cited them or maybe just told them, hey, there's an ordinance and you can't fly here or reach out to city managers and ask them to provide their information. And we're doing both. We're asking people to provide us the information because there is not a government official that wants people to violate the law. They want people to know the law. There isn't a police officer that wants to give someone a ticket because they didn't know the law. They want people to, to comply with it. And every drone operator wants to do the right thing. They just don't know what the right thing is. So we created dronezoning.org where you can log in throw your name on, provide an email address, and provide a link to the ordinance or regulation so that we can find it. Once we find that ordinance or regulation, um, I analyze it with my team of research assistants, and then we put it into AirMap so that it shows up on your map and you don't have a hassle running into the police or a local official and you don't get a ticket. And so it's a very simple one-page form where you can drop a link to the regulation under which you got a, a, a citation. And so we really think this is a great tool 
tool to ensure that our website is constantly updated with the information that drone operators need. And nobody else is doing this. You know, the FAA is talking about launching an app sometime uh, in December of this year, and it's only going to have federal airspace information, which if you're the average drone operator, you're way more likely to get a ticket for flying on the beach or flying in a park or flying near a school or whatever these ordinances are than flying, uh, than, than violating some, some flight rule. And so we really think that this is the important way to crowdsource that information and empower drone operators to fly safely and legally and with a minimal hassle.